Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Apologies, I'm not sure what happened. I just got into the room with all of you as well. Uh, khair inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your patience while waiting for an act of worship to begin. We pray that it is considered to be a form of worship as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us throughout these days and forgive us for all of our shortcomings. Allahumma ameen. Barakallahu feekum. How's everyone doing today? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. We are going to delve right into the content for the day, inshallah ta'ala, just so we can, uh, inshallah ta'ala, finish on time. And uh, if you recall, during our last session, we completed five principles from the tafsir of Surah Muhammad. And today, inshallah ta'ala, we will continue with ayah 18 onwards. So if you will, go ahead and open up your translation of Quran.com, ayah 18 onwards, inshallah ta'ala. Bismillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَهَلْ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَّا السَّاعَةَ أَنْ تَأْتِيَهُمْ بَغْتَ Are they waiting for the hour, meaning the end of times, to come and take them by surprise? فَقَدْ جَاءَ أَشْرَاقُهَا Some of its signs, its indications, have already arrived. They've already come, they've already manifested. فَأَنَّ لَهُمْ إِذَا جَاءَتْهُمْ ذِكْرَاهُمْ Once it actually befalls them, will it not be too late to be mindful, to then turn to Allah? So you want to plant as much good as you can and not neglect turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while all these signs are around us reminding us of the end of times and initiate as much good as you can. We're all travelers and we're all going to depart. We are all travelers and we don't know when we will depart. And we think about here the emphasis on knowledge and action when the Quran or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us throughout the Quran about the hardships of Asa or the difficulties people will uh, face or the signs of the day of judgment, we are always uh, reminded uh, to focus on the knowledge and the action. And so here you have an emphasis on that as well, that they're going to be regretful. They didn't put in the right amount of effort uh, when they had the chance before it was too late. So here's a common question people ask, when is the end of times? When is the hour? And the response to this should always be the same. What have you prepared for it? And what have you prepared for it? And what have you prepared for it? Ask yourself this question. And for those who are taking notes, go ahead and, and think about this question. Uh, maybe it's something you can explore after the uh, class, inshallah ta'ala, in detail. What have I prepared for Asa? What have I prepared for the Day of Judgment? What have I prepared for my departure from this world? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who are prepared. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to die in a righteous state. Allahumma ameen. For those who are interested in language and the gems of the Quran in terms of tafsir, the word in this ayah, ashraquha, uh, the root of this word is unique to this surah. It's found only in Surah Muhammad. And in fact, I was looking into some of the different uh, analyses of Surah Muhammad and I found there are eight words. Their roots are unique to this surah. Eight words that are unique to Surah Muhammad. Amongst them, we covered a few, fata'asan, destruction, ما إن غير آس in water that is not polluted does not uh, become polluted. The word عسل as well honey uh, in this form is found only in Surah Muhammad. Um, and then we have here أشراطها أشراطها the indications or the signs of the day of judgment. One of the most interesting topics that people are always studying. One of the first things people get into they become fascinated by it. How many of the signs have passed? How many signs remain? What are the major signs? And so on and so forth. And later on, we'll cover the additional words that are unique to the surah in terms of their roots. It includes aqfaluha, the locks on the hearts, adhanahum, their hatred, as well as lahm, fi lahn al their tone. We'll talk about this inshallah ta'ala. Now, in this surah, we emphasized before the name of the Prophet sallallahu is found how many times? Who can tell us very quickly how many times did we cover the name of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How many times was the name of the Prophet? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned. Who can tell us in the chat, inshallah ta'ala. How many times the name Muhammad found in this surah? It's a good guess, Jaman. It's not three. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. So the name only in this surah. The explicit name of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, only in this surah. One time. Jazakum al khair. It's found only one time. Jazakum al Sister Ghada. And the root of the name of the Prophet, uh, the, for those who are asking, like, what are their roots? 
we're referring to the trilateral roots here. So the three letters, which in English would be translated as H, M, D. Uh, Hamd, for example, Mahmoud, uh, and uh, Al-Hamid, all of that. The words in the Quran which are derived from this root appear 63 times throughout the Quran. 63 times uh, words that are derived from that same root, including the name Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 63 times. And of course, that, that is kind of interesting. Now that I think about it, the Prophet Sallallahu lived for uh, 63 years, subhanAllah. Okay, so this is about the signs of the Day of Judgment. The, the principle here that we are taking is what, what have I prepared for it? What have I prepared for it? Am I prepared? So this is the question of preparation. If you frequently reflect on this question, then inshallah ta'ala, you'll notice for yourself changes in your life, as well as for your family, as well as for uh, the, the state of the ummah. That the ummah is prepared to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something that benefits us in countless ways and different facets. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us amongst the prepared. Allahumma ameen. That was principle number six. We've covered six principles so far. Let's move on. Ayah 19. This is one of the most important ayat of the Quran in terms of the action items. فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ no, seek knowledge, know well, O Prophet, that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. Ask Allah for forgiveness for your shortcomings as well as for the believing men and women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows meaning your movements and your places of rest. Fa'lam is the first word here. What is this? It is a command. There's an amr here. Fa'lam. One of the greatest blessings of Allah upon us is that we have the ability to know, to learn. And also one of the greatest blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as human beings, our ability to understand conceptual thought is unique to human beings. At this capacity, you see nothing else in the world that has that cognitive capacity, that ability to know, to think with conceptual thoughts like that. Knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with true knowledge, what does it lead you to? It leads you to realizing immediately the right of Allah it leads you to realizing who Allah is. Allah is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Allah is Al-Wadud, the loving. It leads you to recognizing Allah will never oppress any of his creation. So you'll never have that question of the problem of suffering. Why? Because you know who Allah is. That knowledge protects you and helps you in times of hardship. It helps you in times of temptations. It helps you when you need to put in effort to do acts of worship, all the different applications of sabr. And many people go astray and they come to us with questions about Islam or doubts about Islam. And when we get into the details and we start hearing why, I'll ask a few questions. I'll find out what your concept of God is completely wrong. And you took that wrong concept of God and built the rest of your foundation, all the negative assumptions about God based on the wrong notion of who God is. And sometimes this is due to Christianity, sometimes due to uh, atheism, sometimes it's due to uh, Greek mythology, it's just, it could be a number of different factors, but people go astray when they have the wrong idea of who Allah is. People go astray when they have the wrong idea of who Allah is. People go astray when they have the wrong idea of who Allah is. So make sure your concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is based on what he says about himself, based on the study of the Quran and the authentic hadith. Fa'alam, no, is a command to all of us. What are we doing right now? Alhamdulillah, we are seeking knowledge. La ilaha illallah. This is your success. This is why we exist. This is why this world exists. We are created for la ilaha illallah. And it is very heavy. Sometimes Muslims don't realize how beneficial it is, how heavy it is that somebody really believes la ilaha illallah. Beautiful story about the man on the day of judgment from the um of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will have, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, 99 scrolls. 99 scrolls laid out for him as far as the eye can see, every single one of these scrolls, and it has what on it? Deeds, different things that he used to do. And then it will be said to him, do you deny any of these things? And he'll say, no, my Lord, meaning I did do these things. And then it will be said, do you have any excuse or any good deed that you did? The man will have some fear and then he'll say no. And then it will be said to him, yes, indeed, you have good deeds with us and you will not be wrong with regards to your deeds. So then a parchment will come out brought out for him containing what I testify and I bear witness that Muhammad is a slave and his messenger so what will he say my lord what is this one parchment 
compared to 99, meaning compared to all those scrolls. And it will be said to him, you will not be wrong. So the scrolls will be placed, all of them, on one scale and a single parchment on the other side of the scale. And what happens? The scrolls will end up being lighter and that one parchment heavier. In other words, la ilaha illallah, testifying, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, outweighs all of that, meaning it is heavier for you. It is the most important thing you can take. The benefits and the blessings and the rewards and the salvation that come with it are priceless. So protect your shahada, protect your guidance, protect your heart, protect your implementation of la ilaha illallah. This is one of the most important things. And of course, we take from this as well, that the one who has belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amongst the believers and should be supported and helped to become better, no matter how sinful they are, we are supposed to help one another. Also from the hadith, we take what? That everything is subject to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he wishes, he will forgive from his creation by his favor and his mercy. And if he wishes, some of his creation will be punished based on his justice. But at the end of the day, we'll leave it to the wisdom and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, one of the great scholars from the early generations, he said there is nothing heavier on the back of the devil than la ilaha illallah. So be very consistent with it, living upon it, thinking about it, referencing it. La ilaha illallah. Wastaghfir li dhambika walil mu'minina wal mu'minat. And ask Allah for forgiveness. How often do you ask Allah for forgiveness for yourself and for the believing men and women? The best of creations, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was commanded to make istighfar. There's a command. Seek knowledge, know la ilaha illallah, and then seek forgiveness for you will have shortcomings along the way. We are human beings. We will have shortcomings along the way, but you have to learn. You have to learn from these mistakes. And so the Prophet ﷺ, if he's being commanded to seek forgiveness, what about us? We are much more in need of seeking forgiveness from Allah. Astaghfirullah to me. Rabbil khirli wa tub Innaka anta tawab rahim Ask Allah for forgiveness. He is the ever merciful, the oft forgiving. And the people of Iman, the people of faith, know, we know deep down, we're supposed to, always, that we are in need of istighfar that you cannot live without it. That faith, tawheed, submission to Allah is not complete without uh, istighfar, without turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consistently. And remember that no matter what people see of you in public, even your family, and no matter how much the creation praises you or they think good about you, you know for yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has concealed you and covered for you many of your shortcomings. So we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in full repentance and we ask him to forgive us. One of the blessings found in this ayah uh, is it, it extends beyond individualism. What is it? What is the blessing here for the ummah that extends beyond individualism? Who can tell us, inshallah ta'ala? What is the blessing in this ayah that extends beyond individualism? Who can tell us, inshallah? So one of the blessings of this ayah. <clears throat> yes, Jazakumullah khair maiza. You're asking for forgiveness for others as well. It's a command. And by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive others, you are benefiting because the, the angels respond and say the same to you. And the rest of the ummah is benefiting as well. So think about how many of your sins are erased because of this constant dua that other Muslims are making. Those who are living now and those who will come later on, inshallah ta'ala, who make this dua. Oh Allah, forgive the believing men and women, those who are living and those who have passed away. Those who are living and those who passed away. In fact, action item here. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever asks Allah for forgiveness on behalf of the believing men and women, Allah will write for you a good deed for every believing man and woman. Meaning what? You will have hasanat equivalent to the number of believers you just prayed for. Think about the quadrillion hasanat that comes with that one act of worship. There's also something else that we are supposed to take from this. If you are required to make dua to Allah to forgive the believing men and women, what else does this tell us about the notion of ummah, concept of community? If you are commanded 
to ask Allah for forgiveness for everyone else, then also we say you are required to give people advice. We are required to love for others what we love for our, ourselves. We are required to hate for others what we hate for ourselves. We are required to admonish others, give them the beneficial uh, reminders that they need. We're required to give people the benefit of the doubt. We're required to forgive one another as well, not just ask Allah to forgive them, to forgive one another. We are uh, required to uh, prevent others as much as we possibly can from falling into sin, uh, obviously in a way that is suitable and applicable, and trying to bring people to gatherings of goodness, to gatherings of unity, all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to make sure that our hearts are purified. Seek forgiveness for others. And also work on bringing people together and wishing the best for other Muslims. Sometimes, um, may Allah forgive us, sometimes we hear like a Muslim say, man, these people, these Muslims that do X, Y, Z, and they'll start like insulting a group of Muslims. They're like, why? Why not ask Allah to guide them? Why not wish good for them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided you. You're doing good. Alhamdulillah, Allah concealed you. Make dua for their guidance. Don't curse them. There was a Sahabi who was committing a sin, and he learned from this. He was committing a sin. And some of the, the other companions heard about this. So a random man, I'm not sure which companion said this. Somebody basically cursed him. May Allah curse you for committing this sin. Prophet Sallallahu said, don't make dua against him. Don't, don't help, basically. Don't support his devil against him. No, pray for that man's guidance, in other words. Don't be another reason for the devil to overcome that man. No, support your brother, support your sister. So from this ayah, we take a number of things. Again, seek knowledge. No, because it will protect you. It will liberate you from the darknesses of this world. And that is the knowledge of tawheed, the true knowledge of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in terms of the names and the attributes, in terms of the Quran and sunnah. And then number two is to seek forgiveness for others and be a source of goodness for other Muslims. Ayah 20. And 21 together. The believers say, if only a surah were revealed, what are they talking about here? A surah was revealed allowing self defense. When a precise surah is revealed in which qital, fighting, is explicitly mentioned, you see those with sicknesses in their hearts staring at you like someone who is basically on the verge of death. And it would have been better for them. Meaning what? Their reaction to that revelation is not a good reaction because there's a sickness in their hearts. Of course, this is one of many ayat in the surah that indicates why it is surah al-qital. Remember the context we spoke about? The Muslims were being attacked, and this is before the uh, Battle of Badr that was uh, coming soon. And so I guess a question here we can ask very quickly. Uh, for those who are paying attention and taking really good notes, the sickness in their hearts that's referenced here in this ayah, it's referenced in a different form in a previous verse. What do you think it refers to? What is one reference to a sickness in the hearts that was mentioned before? A reference to the sickness of their hearts, these individuals, that was referenced previously. So these are individuals who basically said when they heard the believers say, you know, if only there was a surah that allowed self-defense or allowed, you know, fighting. When the surah is revealed, they're what? They're not happy with it. They're in shock. Hypocrisy, okay. This is true. But there is a specific reference that was given before, a type, a something that they did, these people did. This is a surah that came down and they reacted a certain way. I know this is a very specific trivia question. Trying to get us to think and connect the ayat together, inshallah. So the reference previously, no, it's in this surah, in Surah Muhammad. It, it was in the first session. They hated what Allah revealed. They hated what Allah revealed. So their deeds became nullified. Here, what Allah revealed something about fighting, self-defense here, fighting and protecting themselves, and they didn't like that. There's a sickness in their hearts towards what was revealed. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ta'atun wa qawlu ma'roof, in the next ayah, these are connected, to obey and speak rightly. فَإِذَا عَزَمَ الْأَمْرُ فَلَوْ صَدَقُ اللَّهَ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ 
when fighting was ordained, it surely would have been better for them if they were true to Allah, if they were sincere. Sadaqa. This is very interesting. Here, fellow sadaqu. This, uh, this root, how many times do you guys think it is in the Quran in different forms? Fellow sadaqu. The root of this. In English, it would be S D Q. Sa dan qaf. How many times do you think there are words derived from this in the Quran? If you took a random guess, what would you say? How many times do you have references, different forms of sa dal qaf? That's a really good guess, mashallah. 100 times, mashallah. So it occurs 155 times in the Quran in 19 different forms. For example, they are the ones who true, were true with Allah and they are the ones who are God conscious or from the believers are, are men, meaning people who uh, fulfilled, and this is a very specific reference, very specific revelation, uh, their covenant towards Allah. What does it mean in all the different forms? You have one of them, the meaning of truth, you have the meaning of to fulfill something. You have confirmation of something that came before. You have uh, charity, right? Sadaqa. You have honor. So many things. Now, there's something interesting here. Let's link being truthful and being generous and giving charity, right? You have sidq with Allah, honesty with Allah, honesty as an act of worship with one's wealth, with the loan that you were given will cause you to be amongst those who also give sadaqa, to be honorable in public and private, to give in charity in public and in private. And then fast forward to the day of judgment. Alhamdulillah, sadaqana wa'da. The people enter Jannah. When they enter Jannah, they say, praise be to the one who fulfilled his promise to us. Be sincere with Allah in public and private. Allah will bless you in ways you cannot measure, you cannot imagine. Be consistently sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your relationship with Allah should be based on sidq. So whatever of revelation comes to you in terms of you're learning about something, you're studying something, somebody advises you, be honest with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be honest with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more honest you are, the more Allah will bless you to the extent that even your dreams will be honest. Of course, this means that you'll start to see more and more truthful dreams. As, you, as we get closer to the day of judgment, one of the uh, in fact, since we spoke about فَقَدْ جَاءَ أَشْرَاطُهَا The signs of the Day of Judgment, many of them have already come. One of the signs at the end of times uh, to help the believers for glad tidings, for resilience, for comfort is the uh, truthful dreams uh, that we may have in this world. And these are based on what uh, the level of uh, sincerity, the level of honesty that you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ told us, in other words, to paraphrase, the more truthful you are, the more truthful your dreams will be. The more truthful you are, the more truthful your dreams will be. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us and our loved ones amongst as-sadiqeen and as-sadiqat, the believing men and women who are always truthful. Allahumma ameen. Ayah 22. And here we have what? Another principle. For those who are writing them down, I believe this is our seventh principle now. فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِن تَوَلَّيْتُمْ أَن تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتُقَطِّعُوا أَرْحَمَكُمْ Or maybe this is the eighth principle. Now, if you, this is a response to a continuation to the hypocrites. If you turn away, perhaps then you're going to spread corruption throughout the land and cut off ties of kinship. Allahu Akbar. arhamakum. What's the principle here? It's a principle of preserving families. The emphasis, high priority on certain things. Some people will prioritize, for example, some acts of worship or some habits or some things over others. Family in Islam is one of the most important things to preserve. Prophet ﷺ was described by Khadija عنها, when he first received revelation. She said, The very first thing she said to him, You uphold the ties of kinship. Some people are amazing with strangers. They're so kind to people outside of the house, with colleagues, with classmates, with co workers. MashaAllah, you're like, This person is so kind to me. They're so amazing. They have such good hearts. And then you find out what? Behind closed doors, that individual that man, that woman, abusive to their families, emotionally, or even physically, verbally, or financially. They cut off their relatives easily. They hold grudges very quickly, and they hold on to these grudges and become very angry towards their loved ones for very minor things. They're constantly criticizing very harshly. And they're always a source of some drama. They're always a source of pain. They're always a source of something bad. And they find themselves running away very quickly from relationships. Oh, very easily. Block this person. Block that person. Run away from this 
sibling from that parent, from that child. And that is not from Islam. Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, this womb is a branch from Ar Rahman, Shijnatum min Ar Rahman. Faman qata'aha, whoever cuts it off, meaning whoever basically cuts off relationships, Haram Allahu alayhi jannah. Allah will forbid that person from entering Jannah, meaning what? They will have to be purified as a believer before entering Jannah because of how severe this sin is. And of course, of course, disclaimer this is the general ruling for uh, default families. There are some minor, minor, minor ex exceptions that are given, but it's on a case-by-case -case basis. And if you think you're in that case, you should ask somebody who knows so that you are not making a mistake. So you're not just cutting off everyone and anyone. Now, Sayyidatul Rahim is not easy. It's not easy. And a lot of people misunderstand it. You know, sometimes when children are growing up and their parents, mashallah, are teaching about Sayyidatul Rahim, they'll say, you know, reach out to your relatives. Let's talk on the phone. Call your grandmother, your grandfather, this person, that person. Um, but it's not like there's any problem with that relative. It's not like there's any issue. So alhamdulillah, it's very easy to do. No, Silatul Rahim is tested when they block you, when they cut you off, when they're mean to you, when they insult you, when they talk about you, when they backbite. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Laysa al bil -mukafi'. The one who keeps good relations with family is not the one who is compensated. You're just reciprocating what is easy. Rather, the one who keeps Sayyidatul Rahim good relations with family is the one who does so despite them cutting him off or her off. For example, one time, here's a story. A man came to the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I have relatives with whom I try to uphold Sayyidatul Rahim, the ties of family, but they cut me off. I treat them well, but they treat me badly. I'm very easygoing and forbearing with them, but they're very harsh with me. A lot of people can relate to this. Prophet said, if, if the situation is as you say, then it's as if you are throwing hot ashes at them, meaning it's as if they are being punished because of their major sin towards you, meaning that you're doing the right thing by being patient. Allah will be with you as a supporter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be with you as a supporter meaning against them, meaning you're doing the right thing so long as you remain in the state, meaning don't stoop to their level. Don't also become harsh and rude to them. Don't treat them how they're treating you. You treat them better. You are the one who wants to uphold the ties of kinship. And you recognize that at the end of the day, you are one unit as a family and the devil's trying to break that up. You are not on different teams. Also, here's a gem for those who are interested. Prophet Wasallam told us, uh, verily the quickest act of obedience to be rewarded is to maintain family ties, even if the people of the household are wicked, such that it will grow their wealth and increase their numbers if they maintain family ties. And no people of a household maintain family ties and then remain in need, meaning there's always going to be some blessing for them in some way. And also the opposite. Another hadith, there's no sin that deserves quicker punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the one who does it in this world Along, for, along with what is prepared in the Akhirah, than to transgress and to cut off the family ties. al baghi to cross lines and limitations. rahim And the one who cuts off family ties. Prophet Sallallahu told the companions that there's something better than voluntary fasting and voluntary prayer and voluntary sadaqah. What is it? They said, tell us, Ya Rasulullah. Of course, tell us. Prophet Sallallahu said, it's to reconcile between people. To reconcile between people is to bring them together. When people cut each other off, family members, a parent, a sibling, relatives, uncles, aunts, you try to find a way to bring them back together. Of course, every situation is different. Prophet Sallallahu said the corrupted relationships between people is the haliq or the razor, meaning what? It's uh, harmful. It doesn't mean it's uh, physical here. It means it is very harmful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and guide us. Allahumma ameen. Prophet ﷺ said, the son of Adam does not act with anything better than the salah and to reconcile between people and good character. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst the people who bring the hearts together. We know that today many families are breaking apart. People will either easily cut each other off and say, you know what, that person's rude. I'm never going to talk to them again. Yep, that's not a stranger to you. It's a family member. Find a way to fix the situation. Find a way. For example. Right, re repel evil with that which is better. Sometimes we're thinking about, oh, my right, I don't want to be talked to right. that way. I don't want to be on the receiving end of this or that. If there's a way to change the situation, it would be more ideal to, than to end the situation. However, of course, disclaimer, there are exceptions to this. And there are cases where somebody is justified 
in being distant from a relative or a family member. But if you're not sure about your situation, then always ask. Families are in decline all across the world, especially in Western countries. People are becoming more individualistic and less, um, less patient with one another. People are now cutting each other off very quickly for things that previously they would have learned to overcome or figure out or find treatment for or therapy or uh, mediator, somebody to get in between and help out. Prophet Sallallahu said, the best of you are those who are best of their families. The unit of the family is the unit of society, the unit of the ummah. The shaitan works to break up families. One of his major goals, may Allah protect us all, Allahumma ameen. How you deal with people outside of your house is not who you really are. It's part of it, but it's not the crux of it. Who you are is reflected by how you treat your family behind closed doors. Your family has the greatest right upon you. Your family has the greatest right upon you. Prophet Sallallahu said, and we'll end on this note in terms of this uh, discussion, whoever would like for his rizq, your provisions to be increased and your life to be extended, should uphold the ties of kinship. This means in terms of Khadr, it was written in advance that so-and-so decided to uh, basically increase their uh, rizq and their lifespan by being a person of silatul rahim. So whenever you can, spend time reaching out to your relatives consistently, bringing the hearts of people together and trying to envision constantly a situation in which there is reconciliation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and guide us and uh, bring our hearts together. Allahumma ameen and may Allah forgive us for all of our shortcomings. Allahumma ameen about these individuals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, about the hypocrites who cut off family ties and spread corruption in the world, these are the ones Allah condemned. They were caused to be deafened and basically blinded in terms of actually seeing the, uh, the truth. They chose that path. And then to connect that, subhanAllah, to another thing that deals with the state of the heart, because these are people who corrupt the world. So the principle, again, for that last one, for Ayah 23, uh, 22 and 23, was to preserve family ties. Make that a major goal, and you'll notice the happiness and blessings that come with it for yourself and for the entirety of the Ummah, inshallah. Verse 24 is our next principle. What number is this principle-wise? We've covered five in previous sessions, and today I believe uh, this is maybe our fourth already. Alhamdulillah, we are number nine. Locks upon their hearts. Do they not reflect on the Quran or are there locks upon their hearts? We all say, and right now you're studying tafsir, we all say we believe in the Quran. Great, alhamdulillah. And that we see the world through the Quran, alhamdulillah. And then the question is, how often do we connect to it? How often do we learn it? How often do we study it and reference it and think about it? Are there shackles upon our hearts? Meaning, if you are not reflecting on the speech of Allah, and you're not connecting to it, and you're not moved by it, then look at the state of your heart and be very, very, very concerned for it. Do you not seek to ponder the Quran? It gives you the, 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 the keys to success, the pathways to salvation, the warnings and the glad tidings, the balance that you need emotionally and psychologically, the rituals that you need to practice, the history as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and forgive us. Allahumma ameen. Imagine a door with a lock on it. Behind this door are all the most magnificent things in the world. And you're like, man, forget billions of dollars. If I can get behind that door, I can just be the happiest and most successful person. But you choose not to use the key that you have. You ignore the lock. So to unlock it, to unlock it is for you to be connected to the Quran, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and of course, through its recitation. And this indicates that there are many people who see the signs of Allah, but they are not moved by it. They refuse to accept it. And then we're not talking just about non-Muslims here. This is the reason that many Muslims will see and know the signs of Allah and they'll ignore them. Their hearts are not affected. May Allah protect us all and grant us pure hearts. Allahumma ameen. It's as though there's a partial lock or a block on that heart. And a sign of the shackle is that we are no longer connected to the Quran, that we abandon its recitation, that we abandon tadabbur to reflect on the Quran. This is one of the reasons you'll notice this year, alhamdulillah, in the last few years, there have been so many organizations and institutes trying to teach people not just the tafsir, but to also reflect more on the Quran. You notice, uh, for example, with the Yaqeen Institute, 30 for 30, mashallah, beautiful program uh, that's run every year. You have, uh, alhamdulillah, Al-Maghrib Institute last year as well, the Quran Reflections, and this year uh, as well, the Quran Reflections at the ICD locally, alhamdulillah, and uh, local masajid as well. We've had tafsir classes with reflections for many years, alhamdulillah. And we are continuing because we need to constantly protect the state of our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all this. Yes, specific classes as well through Al-Maghrib Institute, including uh, ART, including Quranic Vibe, I believe, uh, Sheikh Saad and other courses like that. Alhamdulillah. Barakallah So 
The question is, what do I do about it? If I feel like my heart is partially blocked, what's the cure? The, the cure is the very Quran itself. To connect to the truth is to study the Quran, to be moved spiritually, to read it knowing that it's speaking to you, that Allah is speaking to you. It awakens dead hearts and reinforces the living ones. And it protects those seeking protection as they go about life with all of its hardships and its temptations and the need for resilience. The believers are those who, when Allah is mentioned, they find their hearts moved. This is the verse we recited in, um, in the Taraweeh prayer yesterday, subhanAllah. Uh, when they recite the Quran or the Quran is recited upon them, it increases them in Iman. And they put their trust in Allah. Studying the Quran will increase your tawakkul. Connecting to the Quran and unlocking basically the heart will allow you to have a greater level of resilience and trust in Allah, which comes with optimism, which comes with kind of like a cool and calm and collected movement forward towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a story here about an example of a man who wants to commit a sin. And someone said to him, as advice, because they saw he's about to commit the sin, have taqwa of Allah, ittaqillah, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning how can you do that? Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ittaqillah. And his heart was moved by that, meaning he abandoned the sin. He abandoned the thing that he was going to do. Are we doing the same thing today? When somebody comes to you and says, fear Allah, somebody advises you, when somebody sends you a message, when somebody sends you a hadith, somebody says you're not supposed to be doing that, or does the ego, the kibir, the arrogance kick in and the person says, you fear Allah? No, we're supposed to be receptive to nasiha because we care about improving. We care about becoming better. Thank you. Jazakumul khair for the advice. At the very least, just thank the person and move on. And then think about it later. You know what? Maybe there's something I need to change. Maybe there's something that I need to do differently. The believer does not reject the advice or the revelation. Because if you reject people's advice frequently and you get very defensive and so on and so forth when you're actually actually doing something wrong, you should be worried that maybe you're doing the same thing with the Qur'an. Maybe you're also rejecting those commands when the Qur'an comes to you, the ayat and the hadith, and you're thinking what of an excuse. You're justifying. You're ignoring. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. Allahumma ameen. So the believer is the one who submits to the revelation, conforms to the revelation and does not try to change the revelation to conform to his or her desires. That you're not trying to change Islam to suit you as many people are doing today. And many people are learning from uh, the downfall of Christianity and the increasing uh, forms of liberalism in society and secular and atheistic movements. So what are they doing? They're kind of forming what they believe they want as a religion. They're forming their own ideas. I'll take this, I'll reject that. I'll accept this command, but no, this one, no, you're too strict. This is for the religious people. This is cultural. This is... Uh, this and that, they'll come up with an excuse. May Allah protect us all. Conform your desires to the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And know that it will increase uh, your piety, increase your iman, increase your tawakkul. And brothers and sisters, if you ever recite Quran in front of anyone else, be sincere knowing that it could have an impact on their hearts. Be sincere. If you are a qari, if you are an imam, if you teach your uh, siblings, your family, your sisters, if you're uh, with other brothers or other sisters at halaqat, Remember the, the level of sincerity that is required when you recite Quran in front of others to also benefit other people. You want their hearts to be moved for the sake of Allah as you want your heart to be moved as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. Allahumma ameen. And then there are two verses here together. So the, the principle that we just covered, just to be clear, uh, the ninth principle is to connect to the Quran, unlock, unlock your heart, unlock your heart. Locks upon their hearts are things we want to remove. Jazakum al and Sister Maiza for sharing that. Uh, story reference as well, doing dhikr before, uh, subhanAllah, somebody committing a sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, protect us and guide us. Allahumma ameen. Ayah 25. Inna ladina rtaddu ala adbarihim. Min ba'di ma tabayyana lahum al huda, shaytan yusawwala lahum wa amna lahum. Those who relapse into kufr after Islam came to them, after they were guided. It is the devil that tempted them and lured them with false hopes. That's because they said privately to those who also hate what Allah revealed. Remember the people that we referenced before? They hate what Allah revealed. So there's something wrong in their hearts. It's not wrong with revelation. It's a problem with the heart. They would say to these individuals, we will obey you in some matters. But Allah knows what they are hiding. Brothers and sisters, nothing is hidden from Allah. Nothing is hidden from Allah. Nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to write down five different forms of being witnessed, go ahead and write these down. You are witnessed, for example, by people, right? Sometimes people will see you. So you testify 
for or against other people on the day of judgment. Number one is people. Number two is the environment, right? The earth itself will testify for people on that day. So if you read Quran, you're out walking in nature, you're hiking the mountains and you're making a down, you're reading Quran, we hope that the environment will testify for you on the day of judgment. The ard itself will testify. Number three is your body, your hands. And this, this is mentioned many times in the Quran, like in Surah Fussilat, about the details, especially for those who are evil, that their body will testify against them, will speak, in fact, against them. Number four are your angels recording your deeds. And number five, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a witness over you. And that should suffice for you. Five different forms of being witnessed. Is that not enough to change? Is that not enough to become a better person, to have some ihsan? May Allah guide us and protect us. If you would change when people are watching or when you know your body will speak or we know there are cameras. For example, many people in this era of Zoom in the last two years, subhanAllah, I remember when everything first went online, uh, many students were struggling, especially middle school students. Like This is a major responsibility. You can't expect many students to sit down, have their cameras on, take notes and actually pay attention. A lot of students had their cameras off. In fact, some students turned their cameras off after they logged in and then they went to sleep. Right, so one time, one kid, inshallah, he... Uh, he logged in, so his, his, his attendance is there, and turned off his camera. Everyone's cameras were off except the teachers. And then he went to sleep on the bed right behind his laptop. And then his younger brother walked into the room, mashallah, a little troll. And then he, I guess he turned on the camera somehow, turned on the camera and the mic, and now the entire class is watching this kid sleeping on the bed. Allahu al-musta'an. How do you act when you know you're being watched? How do you act when you know the camera is on? You act differently. As soon as you turn off the camera, you're a different person. La ilaha illallah. But different here in one sense of privacy, and then there's a difference here in terms of sinfulness. May Allah protect us and guide us. Remember, Allah is always watching. And remember the different forms of being witnessed. Your angels are recording constantly. Verse 27. And then 28. Wallahi, this is so heavy and frightening, brothers and sisters. How horrible will it be for these individuals when the angels take their souls, hitting their faces and their backs. La ilaha illallah. What are these angels referred to as in the Quran? Does anyone remember? The angels that take the souls and are very severe, the angels of punishment. Who can tell us what they're called? So these angels are hitting the hypocrites. They're hitting them in the uh, face and they're hitting them on their backs as well. These angels are referred to as not Munkar and Nakir. That's a really good guess, Jamal. Munkar and Nakir is in the grave. These are the angels that are taking their souls. And it's going to be a very severe taking. These are an naziat Surah al naziat the very opening. an naziat these are the, the angels that take with that force. Why are their backs being beaten as well or hit as well? Why are their backs being hit? Their faces because they insulted the truth and they, they were very corrupt and they turned other people away from it. Their backs because... They turned their backs on the truth. They turned away after the truth came to them. Right? These are the ayah talking about the one who received guidance and then they turned away from it. They rejected it. La ilaha illallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what about them in ayah 28. That's because they follow whatever displeases Allah. And they hate whatever pleases Allah. So he rendered fa'ahbata a'maluhum. Wallahi, this is frightening. Brothers and sisters, pay attention to the state of your heart. Notice what Allah says here in just these two heavy words. What kari hu ridwana. They hate the things that are pleasing to Allah. They hated, they hated pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a sign that the fitrah is corrupt. The acts of worship that you do, especially as we enter these 10 nights of Ramadan, may Allah bless us all and accept from us. These acts of worship, think of them as a way for you to love what is pleasing to Allah. Allah is pleased with you. Allah loves you for what you're doing. Allah appreciates your acts of worship. So keep doing them and love these things consciously. Think about how much you love these acts of worship and that will help you to improve the quality of your salah and your siyam and every act of worship, that you will love to do the things that are pleasing to Allah. That's how you fight your nafs. That's how you purify the fitrah. Up to this point, up to this point, to, uh, ayah 28 of the surah, there are 10 characteristics that are mentioned about the people of evil, about the disbelievers and even the hypocrites that are referenced, 10 different characteristics. And I'll list them here for you for those who are actually interested. In fact, rather than going through all of them, they reject the truth, they deter others from the truth. They hate what Allah revealed. They have locks upon their hearts. They mock the believers. They assume they don't need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as their mawla. Number seven is they said that they would follow only in some matters, meaning they're accepting, rejecting, messing around with the religion. 
they assume Allah won't expose them. They cut off family ties and their deeds are nullified. Numerous times. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do they think the people with sicknesses in their hearts that Allah is not going to expose them? Remember that you are exposed in times of adversity. Your heart, may Allah protect us all from any adversity. Your heart becomes exposed in times of hardship. And the hidden parts of the heart also come to the surface. So trials bring certain things out that are important. May Allah protect us all. And this reminds us as well that when you see other Muslims sinning, conceal them so that Allah will conceal you. Advise them so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send somebody to advise you. There are many examples of brothers and sisters in many communities who have told us their stories and said, sometimes I'll be in a, a new masjid or I'll go to the masjid and it's very clicky, it's very judgmental. People are constantly talking about personal details, constantly talking about each other. And it's very hurtful and they're doing this and that. They're, they're revealing things about others. Did you hear what she did? Did you hear the brother who stopped praying? Did you hear the sister who took off her hijab? Did you hear about this person who ran away or has a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Did you hear? Did you hear? So they start passing around these discussions in which there is no benefit to your akhirah in mentioning somebody else's situation. You go to that person if you know them and advise them. But don't expose their flaws to other people. May Allah protect us. May Allah conceal us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Allahumma ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who benefit from what we hear. Conceal for others. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will conceal you. These are, of course, references to individuals who are exposed. And then finally, ayah 30 here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Had Allah willed, he would have exposed these people to you, O Prophet. And you would have known them by their appearance, but you will surely recognize them by the tone of their speech. And Allah fully knows everything that you are doing, O people. The more iman you have and the more you sharpen your intellect, you will notice increasing with it is what your firasa. Allah will bless you with firasa, the ability to distinguish truth from falsehood and light from darkness. Sometimes even to be able to notice on the faces of people who are lying and deceiving and hurting Muslims, you'll be able to notice certain things that there's a goodness in this person. Of course, this doesn't mean you can see behind the scenes or anything like that. We're talking about the highest levels of firasa and the intuition that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then finally here, and we'll end on this note, ayah 31. We will surely test you, O believers, to see, to prove those of you who truly struggle in Allah's cause. Brothers and sisters, I'm not going to go into detail in this ayah, but as we are delving into the last nights of Ramadan, push yourself. And remember, every day you're given life in this world is an opportunity to be tested. Now, a test here does not mean difficulty. Of course, the test here is to see who's going to do good. Right? Push yourself throughout these last 10 nights and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from you and make a lot of dua and try to limit the things that are distracting to you and you will notice a sweetness in it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all and accept from us and grant us the highest levels of Jannah. Allahumma ameen. Think about this ayah as we pause here and we'll continue with our fourth session on the day of, I believe, the 26th of Ramadan, about to enter the 27th night next week. And so that will be a very prime time, inshallah ta'ala, to end on a high note with a conclusion, a finale, a summary, and then inshallah ta'ala, the 27th night of Ramadan. May Allah accept from all of you and bless you. Jazakumul khairan for your great interactions, for attending as well. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for shortcomings. Allahumma ameen. Wa salli lahum ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.